Hello, folks out there. Welcome to the meeting for Burn Playground. Um, I'll just wait two more minutes until right at six to start going through the presentation, but we're so happy that you're here and um, thank you so much for your time. All right, it's six o'clock on the dot. Hello, everyone who's here. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Burn Playground Design Meeting One. This is our first community meeting for the renovations to Burn Playground. I'm Nellie Ward. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the project manager from the Boston Parks Department who's overseeing the project. And I will be your primary point of contact through the design and construction process. And I'd like to thank you for your participation in this meeting. And we know everyone is super busy and we really appreciate you giving time from your schedule to join us for this super exciting process. I'd like to welcome any elected officials or staff who might be on the call and ask if you raise your hand if any of you are here tonight, seeing any hands? Not yet. We'll come back to you if you if someone else happens to join the raise your hand. All right, next slide, please. So there's a few things I'd like to go over before we start talking about the project. Um, this meeting is being recorded, and that is so it can be posted on the project's website on the city of Boston's website. Um, it should be posted, this presentation, within a week. And um, Shauna, if you could go ahead and add the link to the project in the chat, that would be helpful. It's also here up on the screen. And anyone that you know who missed this meeting, you'd be welcome to share this um, with them as well and or view the presentation again afterwards if, if you've missed something. Um, so during the presentation, we do ask for your mic to stay off and video off. And then at the end, we'd love it if you could turn your video on if you felt comfortable doing so. And we'll have a um, discussion at the end. Next slide, please. So uh, virtual meeting etiquette. We hope everyone will feel comfortable sharing their questions and comments verbally or in the chat. You're also welcome to reach out to me directly by email if you feel more comfortable that way. And I, um, I'll also add my name and email to the chat so people can do that that way as well. Um, and Zoom tips, next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so pretty soon our design team is gonna give a short presentation and then we'll follow it up by a listening and discussion session. Um, and if a question or comment comes to mind during the presentation, you can add it to the chat and we can address it toward the end of the presentation. Um, if you're joining via Zoom on a computer, you can raise the hand tool, use the raise hand tool and, um, and we'll unmute you. And if you're calling in on a phone, you would press star nine to raise your hand and star six to mute and unmute. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so now that we're done with housekeeping, we're gonna get started on Burn Playground Project Overview. Next slide, please. 
So first we'll, um, we'll give a little introduction to the project team and talk about project schedule and the overview. Then the team is going to present their site analysis, which is the first step of the design um, process and community engagement process. And um, then that will be followed by a listening and discussion session where um, our design team will help to facilitate questions and we'll review a survey, an opinion survey that we'd love to hear your feedback about what the park, how the park is important to you. Um, and that will be online and completable at your convenience. Um, and then at the end, we'll discuss the next steps in the project schedule. Uh, next slide, please. So again, I'm Nellie Ward, project manager from Boston Parks. We have an amazing design team, which we're really excited about from Carly Cottrell. Um, Naomi Cottrell is here as a principal um, do you guys want to jump in and say say hi? <laughs> Are you <unmuted? laughs> Hi there, Naomi Cottrell. Um, we'll I'll introduce our team in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, joined here by Mark Orful. And then online is Anna from our office. Hi, everyone. Thanks, guys. And um, we also have Ross, who's not online tonight, but he is the point person for the Office of Neighborhood Services. So he's also someone you can chat with at any point in time, and his email is there as well. Um, and CCLA has done, Carly Cottrell, our design team, has done a lot of really amazing work. And I'm going to turn it over to them for a minute to go over a couple of projects that um, are important and show their design work. Yeah, I'm just going to start here by saying that we're really excited about uh, the opportunity to work on your park. Um, we do have uh, over a decade of park experience in and around the Boston area, including um, several playgrounds and park spaces in Boston itself. Um, some of our recent work is just shown here um, in these slides. Um, one of the things that I do want to say just up front is the attitude that we take towards uh, community engagement is that we do think that this is your park. Um, the reason why we're here tonight is to hear from you all. We are, we are not experts on burn playground. Um, you all are experts on burn playground. And where we come in is that we're experts on listening to what you have to say and trying to reconcile the challenges and the opportunities that exist here with uh, the desires of the community. So we might be experts on that part, but you all are experts. So this is where we need you is to um, bring your ideas, your comments, your questions, and certainly um, we wanna know more about how the park functions for you today. And so we'll be asking those questions all along um, as we go. Awesome. Thanks, Naomi. That was very well said. Um, so just to give you guys a brief overview of where we are in the process, um, this is the first of three community meetings for the design of Burn Playground. And the goal of this meeting is to collect feedback from you all on how you use the park um, on the site assessment that our that the design team has completed so far and to hear what's really important to you about your park. Um, in addition to the listening and discussion session, in case you just joined, I, I'll just remind that there's an opinion survey at the end to give more thorough feedback than um, what, what you might be feel comfortable giving here. Um, so where we are tonight is at the first community meeting and the survey is open. And we would love to keep that survey open for a couple of weeks. Um, we'd love to get everyone's input by December 20th, if possible, so that we can make sure that your, your feedback is captured into the next step of the process. So in January- I'll Jump in here for a second to say- Sorry. <laughs> jump in here for a second to say that we um, are- yeah, just put, yeah, sorry. Um, 
Oh, I'm here. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, we were technical difficulty here for a second. Um, I just wanted to jump in to say that if you are a member of any kind of community group or you have, if there are local neighborhood um, organizations that we're not aware of right now, um, that you either have Facebook pages, any sort of social media or any way to um, deliver the information that this opinion survey is online, we would love for you all to disseminate this through the neighborhood in any way possible. There is a, going to be postings on the site that will have the QR code for the survey. So people who casually go by can also find it, but please distribute this to the folks that you know in the neighborhood. Thanks, Naomi. Um, so, and, and we'll talk a little bit more again about the survey at the end as well. Um, so at the next the next step after, um, after this meeting and the survey um, is to have community meeting number two, which we're hoping to have sort of towards the end of January. And at that point, we would be presenting design concepts that reflect the community, your all input and desires into a couple of design options that you will then be able to respond to. And the results of that meeting would then go into the third community meeting where we would try to integrate all of that feedback from those concepts into one concept that will get, again, further developed um, into construction drawings. And the third community meeting is also a wonderful place to give feedback and um, continue to engage with the design of the park. And then after we've landed on a design that everyone feels comfortable with and um, works for both you and for Boston Parks, that design gets finalized. And then the targeted date for construction is the fall of 2024. Um, next slide, please. So just to run through a couple of little parts. So aside from our wonderful design team's um, background experience in design, there are some goals that the Parks uh, Department and City of Boston have and um, sort of like, you know, processes and guidelines. So um, you can see that aside from community input, what we're doing tonight, we have safety guidelines, we have the administration priorities, and then we have also parks and rec goals. Next slide, please. So the city of Boston priorities are increasing walkability. We have um, providing resources in neighborhoods that need them most. Thinking about making our city more resilient as a whole as climate change um, becomes more and more pressing of an issue. Public health and trying to find more opportunities to build community in um, at all sorts of different scales. Next slide, please. And finally, um, we have our own goals in the department, the Parks and Rec department, um, and accessibility is probably our um, a really a really driving characteristic of our park design. Universal accessibility, thinking about you know different able able bodied folks and how to create spaces that are suited for all walks of life, um, creating a like sort of diverse and balanced type of uses in the park so that we're not just serving one particular group or group of people that have a specific thing that they want but sort of trying to integrate a lot of different opinions and make multifunctional spaces um, meaningful and inclusive community engagement which is part of what we're trying to do tonight and ad adaptive and resilient landscapes and then promoting connections, not just between spaces, but also between people. And with that, I will turn it over to Mark and Naomi, who are going to run through their site analysis so far. Great. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll be jumping back and forth and working tag team on this. So I promise not to unmute when Mark's unmuted. I won't do that again. Um, so we like this uh, this diagram that Boston Parks shows, um, and we wanted to just focus in on the green part. And I just want to reiterate again that part 
that part of our park design is to hear community input. And that is because without your community input, we might get the other priorities right. Um, and we might be able to build something that is, um, is, is a good design, but it may not be specific enough for the uses within your neighborhood. So the community input that we get all along this process is something that is really important to us. And, and we want to make sure that you hear that loud and clear. Go ahead. Um, we want to just orient everybody to the drawings that we're going to be showing tonight. And um, so just to show you, Everett Street is to the north of the drawings. Um, and we have Mill Street to the east of the drawing, to the east of the park, um, and then Elm Street to the west. Uh, you all are probably familiar with this, but wanting to make sure that you understand it as a map. Um, we have the, the um, children's playground area in the lower left-hand corner, and then the open, the lawn area in the upper right-hand corner so that everybody's just oriented. We're gonna go in and actually talk about each of these areas individually. We'll go ahead. Um, and and, and we're, we're calling them out and showing them to you based on the current uses. And we'll talk about each of these areas. Um, in, in response to some of the things that are goals that Boston Parks put together as far as diversity of uses and um, inclusive spaces and um, spaces that are flexible, we do wanna show you so that folks understand the percentage makeup of what different um, elements take up in, in the, the park. So we do have in the lower right-hand corner, just for folks reference, um, what the different areas take up space-wise. Um, this is not, this is just an inventory. There's no, there's no judgment on that, but to really understand that in some ways we kind of have a, um, a one-third, one-third, one-third breakdown of space that's being used by the park with playground, um, the courts, and then say the area that's the more passive or the walking um, area, somewhat being an equivalent um, of spaces. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go, go forward. Go ahead. Yeah, so jumping right in, we have the playground area, which is uh, rather large for the use that we have here. Um, and it's separated by a, a fence and a gate, um, which is great, you know, creates a sense of enclosure and, and security. Um, there are mature trees that offer lots of shade um, with some problems with sap and um, making the play surfacing slippery. Um, one benefit is play equipment that's suited for various ages, uh, but it is at the end of its um, useful life. And we think that this is a great opportunity to um, make it more inclusive and have more avenues for play. I think I'll just add that, you know, this is an area where we went out and you can see our photographs here and the times that we've been out here, we did not see a huge number of users. Um, part of that could have been the time of day that we were there, the time of year we went during the school year. So kids that would maybe be using it heavily during the summer were not there. Um, so as we get to the end and the open discussion portion of our um, time together, we do want to hear from you all regarding the use um, and what the best use is and maybe some of the challenges of this area. We will say just one other thing, you know, there aren't that many parks that have the ability to have a swing set because that takes up a lot of space. So that's another thing as far as we'd love to hear how used that is because it takes up a lot of space, um, but it is a unique thing um, to have in, in a park. Well, I think that that's probably it for this. I think the one thing that we would, maybe the other thing I would add here is that um, this playground area has one gate and we have pointed that out on our analysis. Um, that's something that's great if you wanna keep the kids in, but also um, not necessarily best practices as far as safety and security, because if you are in this area and you wanna get out quickly, um, so it's something that we just are going to talk about in a couple of different locations. So we'll, we'll continue. Jumping into the old street hockey court, um, we it's really kind of the opposite of the playground. 
There's not a lot of shade. It's very open. Um, we've noticed that there's some surface deterioration, um, remnants of the old street hockey court. There's now uh, an engaged an active user group playing pickleball that they've set up um, here, as well as noticing some um, planters that have been damaged um, that you know may or may not be maintained by a local um, community group. Um, it also is, has the same kind of situation as playground where we have one opening uh, into the space. Yeah, so again, we, you know, it's ex always exciting to see a park and to see a park that has been in some ways uh, improved or, you know, revised by local users. So it is exciting to see that there are folks out here who have spent their time and, and, and money to uh, provide the pickleball amenities. And so we do want to hear about um who the users are and if you're the users, how you like to use it and when you use it um, so that we can understand the benefit for this for all. Um, I will say again that the that there with the single opening, it's not the safest thing. Um, and so we wanna provide more you know, openings between areas. Um, but uh, it's interesting. We, we definitely wanna hear from you all about, about how you use this. Moving on to the splash pad area, uh, it's centrally located within the park, but um, has no real enclosure. So there's not a good defining boundary of where that ends or where people, you know, to contain people who are using it. Um, there's one element with um, limited opportunities to play, uh, but it's really nice to have access to water uh, during our hot summers. Would say that the other thing that we think is a real benefit about how this is right now is that it isn't something that's say raised up. Um, it is accessible. You can wheel into the space, um, and if you're say using a, a cane or a walker, you don't have to navigate any kind of step up, which is great. Um, we just think that the that there, you know, since there's water that feeds the park, that potentially if if folks are are still interested in maintaining this as an element that we can do a whole lot more, that it could be certainly more exciting um, and utilize the infrastructure that's there. We've called this space the walking loop, but it's really the connecting space. Like it, it connects all the other elements within the park. Um, we've noted, mature trees that surround a um, oval lawn. They're seating with shade. Um, the community bulletin board, you know, shows us that there's an active community and we were really excited to see that being, um, you know, changed throughout our visits there. Um, one of the uh, kind of challenging aspects is that all of the lawn areas are raised with curbing, which makes it an accessibility challenge. Um, there's also a lot of pavement. So in the uh, in our hot summers, that can make it feel even hotter. Uh, and we're thinking of ways that maybe we can alleviate that. Yeah, so again, for you all, the what we're here to, to hear from you on is, you know, we have seen, we did see a lot of people strolling through here. This is one area that during our site visits, there was a lot of walking, um, but we would like to understand other than say walking through the space, if this space provides um, opportunities for community that we're not seeing at this point. And we do see, again, the central lawn is quite large um, but we are questioning whether or not it's used in the summer months because it is so wide open and without shade, or if it's if it's used at any other time of the year, um, if if people gather on it. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the some of the other things as far as vegetation, but love to understand um, how folks use this space uh, besides walking. 
opposite that is the tennis court. And um, just like the ho three hockey court in the playground, we have one point of entry. Um, it's completely fenced in. Um, we were really excited to see the community presence with the games attached to the fence and, and you know, looking like people use this space. Um, there's a nice bit of shade, uh, but it is one, uh, or it is a large area that's dedicated to one use. Um, so interested to hear it, how important that is. Or if, again, if, because we, when we went there, we didn't see anybody using it. If this area is used and utilized for other purposes besides the the tennis court, um, you know, how has the, the neighborhood actually, um, how, has, how have they used this in ways that we don't see, the patterns that we don't see? Uh, this diagram shows the overall site amenities that we identified on site. Um, so mainly benches and trash cans outside of the specific equipment for each area, like the play structures and, and tennis nets. Um, it's an inventory of what's there and much of it is outdated and maybe past its useful life. Um, we noticed that there weren't many amenities to gather around like a picnic table or other kind of game tables. Uh, but through this, we've, we've also identified that there is a strong community supporting this park with the added benches, the games, um, and the community sign and planter. Um, so, you know, through our opinion survey, we want to hear what, what, is important and what you feel we you need for this park. Great. Um, one of the interesting things that we identified was the amount of fences that are located here. And they're all of varying heights and conditions. And they've kind of, I think, been added and, and um, enhanced over time. Um, in some sense, they create enclosure for these different uses, uh, but it also limits interaction. You don't have that kind of random interaction of users of the park. Uh, I think one of the benefits of them is the sense of safety you get of being separated from the street. So from cars or keeping balls within the playground. Um, but overall, the, the kind of fencing within the park is lacking cohesion um, because it, it kind of looks like it's been built out over many years and renovations. Yeah, and it probably is. is there, there may be folks on this call who have been um, neighbors of this park for a long time, and you know that its history started off and, and it has been added to and renovated um, piecemeal over many decades. Um, and so we do, when we see fencing like this, uh, we realize that it's probably because one area was renovated and then the next area was renovated later and then the next. So um, one of the things that we really want to do in this, in this process is really look at the park overall and holistically um, for really the first time since it was built, because it has been, like I said, it has been renovated many times, but never in its entirety. Um, I do want to just point um, out the image in the, the bottom middle. Um, one of the things about all of these fences is that if you stand at a distance, you can see many of them, in some cases, layering up on each other. And so it, it can feel a little bit intimidating or claustrophobic um, when, you, when you see the fences layering up on each other like that. So it's just something that um, we'd, we'd like to make better if possible. We also took a look at the access and circulation of the park. Um, it's a it's a big park, uh, but with only two points of entry, and um, we there's no access from Mill Street, um, which we witnessed as being one of the busier streets. Um, 
there is a, a third entrance, but that's dedicated to vehicular use only, um, which is located up here. And we've noted that this, with this dark gray shading, this is the, the access needed for the Parks Department um, vehicles for maintenance. Um, I think, you know, one of the things we noticed with the circulation was that a lot of these paths are kind of dead ends. Like we we end up in a room of the playground or the street hockey or the tennis court. Um, but there's also opportunities for, you know, doing a walking track or um, tricycle track. And um, we want to hear how important that is to you. Uh, Within the park, there's a lot of paved areas, uh, and this is, um, we've kind of, I think, made it look kind of stark, just to show how little of the park is um, is pervious, you know, to let water infiltrate into the ground. And um, that's made worse by the fact that the pervious areas, or many of them, are separated with curbing. So they're raised above the paved surface. And that really poses a drainage challenge when we have um, storm events. And so a lot of the water that lands in the park is ending up in the street or um, in, instead of, you know, being returned back to the ground. Uh, the, this amount of paving also makes it even hotter in the summer. It feels like, you know, very, uh, well, more more hot than on a shaded or, you know, if you're standing in the lawn. Um, one of the benefits though, is that these paved areas are all coplanar, which makes it uh, better for people with mobility challenges. So we wanna hear from you, um, you know, how important is it to, um, you know, lessen the pavement or provide other opportunities for vegetation. I think that the the only thing I would add there is um in when we start to discuss the area of the walking loop and and the places that we're showing, you know, in this diagram, the light green in the upper right hand corner that are all lawn and planted areas, um, you know, is is it important that these things are raised up above on a curb? Or could you imagine them being at the same elevation as as the uh paving so that maybe we can pitch some water into them. Um, there's lots of things we can do here. We don't, the fact that 76% of this park is paved, a lot of it has to do with the function of um, the fact that you have big courts and then you have walking areas um, that are paved. But we we know we can do better, even, even if it means that a court may still function for a sport, but it might be constructed differently so that it allows for some water infiltration. So those are things that we'll come back back to you on. And the opposite of that is the vegetation layer. So one of the big benefits of this park is that we have a lot of mature trees that offer a plentiful amount of shade. Um, they're it, the trees do lack biodiversity. We have a few major species. Um, and we have the challenge of the sap from the linden trees over the the playground area that, you know, have caused problems with the surfacing and, um, you know, people's clothing. Um, we have engaged an arborist to assess the trees and I, that work is um, ongoing. Uh, we also, there, there are uh, short hedges that frame the playground area, and you know, we've noted that these are, um, they pose a maintenance challenge. They tend to collect um, litter and uh, maybe provide hiding places for rodents, but um, so we're going to take a look at that. I think the one thing that in this slide that we um we wanted to ask about is about, you know, there's this nice, nice little planter that's associated in the upper uh, northeast corner that's associated with uh, the community um, bulletin board. And somebody's taking care of that planter. 
So we'd love to know who, we'd love to know if there was more interest within the community for more color and more texture and and whether or not there were groups that were interested in, in helping with that kind of maintenance. Um, we do we do realize right now that we we don't we we do lack um, because there's so many the same the species that that we have don't have a ton of um, of interest with flower or um, with a lot of texture um, so we would love to add to that but we would love to hear your opinion on the um, potential ask of, of helping with that if folks are really interested in, um, in, in more of that. This is our last slide, right? So this is, we've sort of laid the groundwork of what we've seen here um, and hopefully posed a bunch of questions for you all to get, get you thinking um, as we think about trying to, um, you know, make a holistic change here to the, to the park. Um, so we just we're going to put this slide up here because again um we do have an a, we do have a an online opinion survey that certainly we want to distribute but we would love to just talk tonight and these are some just leading questions about what spaces are working the best which ones don't don't work well um how do you spend time here and how do you want to continue to spend your time here um how does this park foster community? Um, does it? Can it do that more? Um, what are you excited about seeing in the future? And what do you want to make sure you protect? The, those are kind of the big, and, and those are also um, the themes of our um, online survey. So if you're shy and don't want to talk about those here tonight, um, certainly you can help us in that way. Do you want to, do you want to just go quickly to the survey? If if you want to do the survey while we're talking, <laughs> you can do the QR code here and go to our survey. Um, we'll hold this here for a couple minutes. Uh, Nellie, can you post the link in the chat too? Okay. I'm also doing that right now. Great. Um, we'll go and then we'll just go back to the plan because sometimes it's nice when we start to talk that, that we can, people can see what other people are talking about. So if we go back to the um, just to this plan that sort of labels the area so we can all talk about the same. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Naomi Market, um, for all of your work. And um, I also noticed that Kwana Wise, the Director of Community Engagement for the Boston Parks Department is here. Uh, welcome, Kwana, and you're welcome to jump in and say anything if you'd like. We'd love to hear from you. But with that, um, Shauna, if you could please help us with um, with um, answering questions in the order that hands were raised, that would be amazing. <clears throat> okay, so the first person is Paul Darty. Great, go ahead, Paul. And also just to say, we'd love it if you felt comfortable turning your videos on, but no pressure. <laughs> Yeah, put the video on. There you go. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> that was a great presentation. You know, you really got a pretty good handle on everything in the park. Well, I have to say, so we've lived here for myself and my wife, Denise, for actually over 40 years. So I'm pretty uh, familiar with the park and things that have come and gone over the years. And I think right now, I think it's at its pinnacle of uh, use. Um, some of the things you mentioned uh, uh, make a lot of sense. The tot lot, you know, unfortunately, your at your visits just weren't the right time to see how much the park was being used. Uh, it gets a terrific amount of use. The uh, the walk and loop, the grass area there, early morning, midday, evening, tremendous amount of use. People walking their pets and stuff like that. The loop around it. You have some people walking it. Then you have parents um, with their small children on their bikes or tricycles. And uh, the pickup, uh, the tennis court does get used quite a bit. And uh, now let me say, of course, my uh, my fondest thing is the pickleball court. It's gotten a terrific amount of use. It's been the center of over the summer. We had a couple of uh, get-togethers of neighbors 
centered around it there. You know, we had a pizza evening. Then on a Sunday morning, we had a coffee and donate get together. We were attended by neighbors. Neighbors meeting each other was really great. You know, we had a local businesses that sort of uh, sprung for the uh, for the uh, in, food, you in know. The yeah, in the neighborhood association. Um, you know, I, I look at the pickleball court and we have the two makeshift courts there and they do great. When you talk about uh, needing more uh, green area, I could see, you know, the, the part of that uh, pickleball court that's adjacent to uh, Everett Street. Maybe that could be, uh, you know, greened up down there. And uh, yes, yeah. And uh, the uh, bushes around the uh, playground, the children's tot lot, you're correct that that old, uh, that old shrubbery there is really uh, a nuisance now. It's, uh, you're afraid to let the kids near it. You don't know what's in there. And, um, but uh, I'd like to say, uh, you've got a pretty good handle on it. Uh, uh, probably in the whole city, there probably ain't a nicer park than this. It's always kept clean. You know, the park uh, workers, they love to come down there because it's an easy job. You know, they come down, pick up a couple of things, break up the leaves, you know, so it's really great. And like I say, we've been here 40 years in, uh, in I think the park is at its uh, height right now. So uh, hopefully you won't change too much. You like to get a little more sun into that tot lot. And uh, and so uh, I tell you, thanks for doing this. And we'll- uh, Can I just add, can oh, I sure, say one sure. thing? Um, they asked um, about the bulletin board. So Paul is the one who built the bu bulletin board. He kept it for many years, and now Greg Sullivan is um, the main keeper of the bulletin board um, these days. The planter there also was something that Paul did this past year. Um, he was the one who put the flowers in there. So, um, and all of those other little games that you see along the park, um, that was, those are all things that Paul added as um he thought that they might be of interest to um, the neighbors and stuff. And I also just want to add about the, in the summertime, our August, our national night out, our, the neighbors that um, came out, it was spectacular. And the amount of young children in this neighborhood, like we had no idea. That taught lot was packed with kids playing. So they're there and they're getting bigger and they're going to be looking for places. I grew up here. So I'm here six, more than 60 years. My kids grew up here. My grandchildren, I, I have them at the playgrounds all, you know, whenever they come to visit, they love it. The first thing they say is, can we go to the playground? Okay, so and I and I do believe that the trees are important because it's one of the only shaded playgrounds that I know about that you can go and not worry about your kids getting sunburns or heat stroke for the rest of us. Okay, so thank you. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of follow-up questions if that's okay. Can I do that? Sure. Okay. Um you talked about two really well um, attended community events, one in and around pickleball with food, and then you're at the um, the evening out during the summer. Could you, do you, did they, did people bring tables for food? Was there anything that was missing from the park as far as amenities to allow those events to happen? Would tables well, help? Would you know, place to eat, lunch, help. Um, what do you think uh, could be added that's missing right now? Yeah, uh, well, that's a quite uh, great question. You know, when you mentioned that, I, I thought, I said, geez, wouldn't it be nice, you know, to have a couple of those uh, uh, concrete tables you see in other parks where people could sit, maybe bring their yeah, lunch and stuff. When uh, With the evening and the Sunday uh, activities we had there, uh, people bought their own chairs, uh, you know, within the neighborhood, we had enough coolers and, you know, uh, folding tables for what we needed. And um, in this, you know, it's kind of informal events that, you know, and they're, uh, they're very good, you know, people just stand around, they're talking, laughing, and uh, the same with the pickleball on Sunday, on Sunday, uh, uh, myself and my family would uh, get together 
and uh, we play over there, and it's it's just all laugh and and uh, joke and and uh, and just you know just a good time. Um, any other questions? Well, so the second question is, and then and then we'll let other folks go. But you're talking about the pickleball, which is definitely more geared towards adults, and the playground, which is more towards kids. Are there t any teenagers? And maybe I'm asking this question maybe to the whole group. Are there teenagers that use the park? Um, typically, the things that we have right now that are amenities within this park are not things that teenagers use. But I would love to understand if there if there are um, older older children or teenagers and how we might be able to encourage them to come out. Yes, uh, I'll answer that. You know, as far as I know now. Uh, I'm not sure if there's two or three teenagers in our whole neighborhood. Uh, our neighborhood has changed quite a bit. I'm sure you probably realize that. And it's uh, younger people, professional. And uh, like I say now, some of them have a lot of younger kids. And uh, they're starting to get the use of the tart lot. And uh, uh, we have uh, a nonprofit just a couple of blocks away from uh, Work Inc. is the name for it. And uh, occasionally people, you know, that uh, their clients will come up there and walk around the park and stuff. And, uh, but like I say, you even said the pickleball is for everybody. Anybody can play pickleball and it's, you know, no matter what your age is. And it's, uh, it's a, the like, and then the tennis court does get a lot of use. There was a, like, private lessons going on over there you know uh a couple of adults with a a bunch of uh kids and uh it was good to see that and uh i think that's about it <laughs> yeah thank you okay. so much you two that was super helpful we really also just appreciate all of the work that you're doing in the park right now it's amazing oh thank you who do we have next, Shauna? Okay, next is Chelsea. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so we live right on Mill Street, close to kind of like Everett and Mill. We're there pretty frequently. And like Paul said, there are tons and tons of kids. Clearly, you can see the one that's on me right now. Um, majority of the kids, I would say, are 10 and under right now. So there are some teens, but not like a lot right now and to z's point any that we do typically see are either on the tennis court or the pickleball court um biggest thing i would have to say is like really just protecting that playground as much as possible because especially in the evenings like i would say when it's light out and not dark anytime after four o'clock especially in the summer four to like really eight o'clock it's really busy at that playground um tons of meeting spots for parents. Like the benches there are amazing. I would definitely agree with everyone in the chat. Those shrubs have to go. They are awful. Who knows what's in there? I know my husband has seen people hiding. And I don't want to say hiding, but sleeping in them. Um, so definitely getting rid of those would be ideal. Keeping a fence there would also be really great just to make sure. It's nice just to let the kids run and not have to worry about them running out of the road because there are those access points. So keeping a fence there is huge. Someone else said it in the chat, keeping the swing set. Kids love the swing set. Having the ability to have the little toddler seats and the regular seats, I would say is huge because like I said, there are a lot of really young kids, but then sometimes we want to use like a regular big kid seat. Um, also, I would say like the trees there, they might have to get lightened up a little bit. Totally understand that. But the shade that we get is incredible to have, not have to worry about sunburn, like Paul said, um, just letting them run around, not have to worry about that. And I know that there are a lot of other moms in like adjacent neighborhoods who do come to our playground because of the shade, because like they said, there's not really a whole ton of shade in any others. Um I would definitely say keep the bulletin board there. It is cute. It's fun. Paul does a really nice job there. The splash pad, I would love to see a splash pad kept, but also just made a lot larger. The kids love that one little thing that we have. So giving them just more than that, I think would be 
incredible and just like another great extension of the playground. Um, the last two things I would say is it's nice having the pickleball and the tennis courts. They do get used frequently. It would be nice if maybe one of them could be more like a flex area. So instead of having two specifically um, designated courts, maybe one can be more of a flex space, but still have the courts. Um, and then the only other thing I would say, especially because you've been talking about grass and all of that stuff, our park is used a ton for dogs. So just thinking about like how frequently they go to the bathroom there, like that's definitely something to keep in mind because people take their dogs there like crazy and use that main walking loop and that big like open area of grass um, to walk their dogs, play fetch and all of that stuff. So that's the only other thing I would add, Brad, anything? Yeah, and then I would, there's really just three main things to, to bring up from my perspective. Like Chelsea said, we're right across from the tennis courts on Mill Street. So there was a comment on the different fences and sizing. Um, I'm very much thankful for the 12 foot fence right there because we still do get tennis balls across the street. But um, I think they, they are there for logical reasons. Um, maybe, like you said, some more internal pathways just between the different designated areas. But speaking to just the entryways in general, even though I'm in Mill Street, I'm very much a fan of not having an entrance on that street. There's a larger issue of that street being a busy pass-through street where the speed limit and the stop sign are definitely not obeyed by every driver. So it's definitely more of a safety factor for kids and animals running around. So I do like having it more restricted to those two entrance points. Not that you probably have any hole in this perspective, but I'll just put a plug in there. Speed bumps. Um, the rest of great, but <laughs> I know that's not part of this project. Uh, and and yeah, just just to reinforce that the pickleball space heavily used. Um, I play lacrosse. I move the nets back and forth to to have an open space for for what I do. I do appreciate the larger fencing area because it prevents balls flying around. Um, and I do see people like even bringing weights over and working out in that area. So it's a very heavily used space for a lot of different things. I I, I tend to do this, so I have a couple follow up questions. <laughs> Number one. Uh, are you annoyed and or bothered or concerned about the slickness of the play surfacing? Is that something that you have um, and your children have had any issue with? Oh, you're, I think you're muted. Chelsea, you're, oh, there you're we go. Okay. Uh, it wouldn't let us unmute uh, on okay. our own. Um, so it can get slick. I will say that. Um, that an outdated it is play surface. Like an outdated play surface. It does get slick. So I don't know if there's some kind of analysis that can be run on like the trees themselves to help reduce like sap that might drop and like take care of those trees, but then leave others speaking to the biodiversity that was brought up. But, so. it, but it hasn't been something that ever has kept you away. I mean, it's a nuisance, but it's not something that would keep you from not wanting to use the correct. space. Correct. Okay. Correct. So then my other question is you talk about the splash pad being great and being an amenity. However, it's not fenced. So you talked positively about the playground being fenced, but when you allow your children to play in the splash, splash, pad, pad, splash pad area, are you concerned? Do you protect the, the entrances? Like how, or is that not a big, as big of an issue in the splash pad area? I think again. Thanks. Um, I would say for me, I don't know if the other moms want to say anything in the chat. I'm not as concerned with the splash pad being enclosed, mostly because kids in water, I usually want to be a little bit more hyper aware when that's going on. But if there was an opportunity to enclose it, also might be good. But there's also that natural half barrier already with the concrete benching around it, which helps provide a protective face. So like the parents stand on the other side and watch the kids play. And that usually works out really well. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chelsea and Brad. That was really great feedback. Um, Shauna, who do we have next? Okay, we have Brian. There you go. All right. Thank you. Um, well, the, the the folks before me kind of nailed it here. Um, and so 
the park i think is vital to our neighborhood we have a nice little community that's really built up around the park um my so my office actually looks out onto the park um so whenever i'm bored working i just watch the park all day so i, I see what goes on there quite a bit and the usage of pickleball since paul put in the initial court there has exploded over there that that hockey court or whatever it was called it whatever you want to call it i i when i moved in here a few years ago i was excited i was going to use it but it was it's unusable um for that once pickleball was added it's constantly a, a new rung of people we could actually probably use a third court in there if we could um just because so many people use it and it's brought so many people together throughout the neighborhood i've met several neighbors just jumping out on the pickleball court with them and that's from little kids out there as young as i think i've seen three-year-olds out there playing up to people of all ages so uh the pickleball has become very important in the neighborhood and the tennis court while i don't play i see a ton of people out there playing very often um the walking loop i think is a really great area it just needs more grass it's it's a lot of cement out there. We have tons of dogs in the neighborhood. I know uh, we we need more space for the dogs to run around. Um, and then I, I have a little one myself, so the playground is very important to us. We love bringing her out on the swings. She's still uh, she's just learning how to walk, so she's uh, not as good on the other stuff just yet. But I think the park is great as it is. I'd love to see some of the curbs taken out. I guess. We just need more green, more flowers in there would be nice, more plants and vegetation, and really just enhance everything. The playground has some great things, but it's all very old. It's not it's not like great equipment or anything like that. It's really about enhancing what's already there. And I, uh, I actually moved here a few years ago from the North End where I was right across from the park on Commercial Street where they redid that whole park. And it took it took like two years for them to actually redo the park. And we lost that park the entire time. Losing this park for two years would be devastating as a neighborhood. So I want to say whatever changes we do make, we don't drag them out. It, we don't need wholesale, like wholesale changes here. We need enhancements. Um, so I, I think that's key. And I think what everyone else has said is I would just echo what they've said so far. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, and I, I just in regards to construction, um, construction schedules can vary very widely, um, but typically the fastest you would ever see, and this would be a really small park, would be a six, like six months. And um, we've seen six months to like two years for parks um, in Boston because of like the supply chain issues and um, you know, subcontractors and like the labor market and all of that. So I do want to say that while I completely hear you and I know it's really challenging to have limited access to a park, um, it, it we will have to go through that at some point. Um, but understanding that, you know, um, that this is a super critical asset and how can we like expedite and like streamline the construction process will like totally definitely be considered and thanks for for bringing that up yeah that that would be huge just because we do have some great community events and it's it's really the central hub of this whole neighborhood understood and yes we we do understand how important that that is um and i also just want to mention that people are adding things to the chat and that's all great and we are gonna all of that will be recorded and incorporated into the um feedback process so um, even if we're not talking about it right now, we're going through the raised hands, we will come back to that. And um, it, it will, all of that will be captured. Um, I think we have one other hand raised. And again, I'll just add the survey in the chat one more time. Is it, Shauna, is it Mark or Matt? Um, I think, yeah, Matt was next, but then David Lewis is in front of him, so I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, so I'll click on David. Okay, thank you. We just looked online and we have 10 responses to the survey already. So Yay. keep going neighbors. 
<laughs> um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, um, folks who are hosting this. This is super informative. And uh, thank you, Paul, for all the work that you've done in the park um, and neighbors who are using it. Uh, I'm a resident on Ashland Street. I have three young children. Um, we've been here for about 10 years, um, and we abut the park on the backside. Um, and we use it frequently. Um, love Burn Park, definitely see some opportunity for improvement. Um, I'll echo a couple of things that folks have said, and then I have something additional to add. Um, the things that I'll echo, I do think um, just in general, less asphalt, more green space. Um, when you look at the walking loop area, um, finding ways to make it a little bit more oriented towards community gatherings, such as like semi-permanent picnic benches and that type of thing, I think would be great. Um, reducing the shade a little bit in the tot lot, thinning out some of those trees, um, just it's like very shady and, you know, does have, um, you know, leaves and associated issues with the trees. So I'm not saying, you know, completely thin it out, but um, maybe thin it, thin it out a little bit there. Um, and then um, just modernizing and updating that play structure. Um, I do think, you know, it's, it's a highlight of the park. Um, and I know that there are great materials now that to really make it, um, you know, something that can last for decades to come. Um, I agree that the shrubs are unsightly and a maintenance issue um, and a safety issue. Um, so getting rid of those and just overall sort of more green space um, and less curbing to um, reflect more of what I think the values of um, folks are going into the 21st century and the need to, um, you know, have more access to um, open green space um, in, in urban environments um, is great. So I know other folks have already said it. I'll just echo um, and maybe a little bit fewer fences. I know some of them are um, needed for sort of, you know, utilitarian functions that they serve. But to the extent that we can um, get rid of some of the closed off nature of the park, um, I agree with that sentiment. Um, and even updating more access points, as you guys have pointed out, I, I know that Mill Street is very busy. So I um, agree with uh, Brian or whoever it was that was saying, you know, maybe that's not a good idea to put an access point there, but more access to the park would be great. Um, and some safety issues to safety, uh, this might not be parks and recreation, but to reduce maybe some of the speeding and the traffic to make it more walkable, um, you know, for um, families and young kids. Um, I don't know if like you know, wider sidewalks is it all a possibility? Speed bumps were mentioned, like, you know, really clear, big crosswalks, just stuff that show that this is an area where there are kids. Um, then the the part that I wanted to mention uh, that other folks have not, and I, I fully recognize that I may be in the minority on this, um, but I have to say it because it's a value of ours. Um, all of my, you know, my children play basketball. I have a lot of friends who play basketball. There really are no basketball courts in our area. There's Victory Park, um, which is not a very pleasant walk from where we're at, um, you know, down to a really busy street and, and not super accessible. And that's really it. And then you're talking about like Townfield and Fields Corner or Hemingway, um, really areas that you kind of have to drive to. They're, you know, much more of a substantial walk. Um, and as we're talking about the young children in this area growing a little bit older, um, you know, I, I do think even having a half court um, would mean a lot um, to kids who do play basketball because this is Boston and it is a really popular sport here. Um, I know like in back of the Hale School in Roxbury, they have a park that has like a, an undersized hoop, like an eight foot hoop or a nine foot hoop that, you know, still gets a lot of use. So I'd be even open to having, you know, um, some kind of, you know, basketball situation that is more geared towards younger kids. Like I'm not talking about a full court because I don't think we have the space for that. And I know people are pretty attached to um, the tennis and pickleball options that are here. But I think, you know, something that young people could just dribble a ball down and get a little pickup game or, you know, shoot around with um, fathers and 
sons and daughters. Um, that would really, you know, mean a lot um, to me just because there really isn't that um, option in our neighborhood at all right now. So um, somebody had brought up a flex use or mixed space use with one of the paved areas. And I would just advocate um, to consider whether um, that could possibly be folded into that idea. Um, and thank you for listening. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because that was sort of my leading question regarding teenagers. Um, and, and so I think it's a good comment. I'd like to hear a little bit more. I think you all have, seem like you have a neighborhood that works together pretty well and um, are um, respectful of one another. But if we have those flexible spaces, what it means is that if someone is out there shooting hoops and you come and you're ready to play tennis, everybody waits their turn. And so there, you know, there are some of those uh, just being neighborly that, that would need to happen, which I think it seems like you all have. Um, and that could be a way we, we use the community board. We have a rules of how long you're allowed to play in certain things if someone's waiting. So um, I love the idea of finding ways to allow for us to engage teens. Um, and that may not be basketball, it may be something else. But um, uh, to your point, I think it's I think it's important um, to make sure that we don't leave out the children who are maybe outgrowing playgrounds. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, Shauna, is Matt next? Yes, he is. Thank you. You're welcome. There you go, Matt. <clears throat> Hi, how's it going? Thanks so much, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you can. Awesome. Um, so I abut the park. I live on Elm Street. Um, I use the park daily. Um, I walk by it daily. And even times that I'm not using it, I kind of see what's going on being that I live so close. Um, I definitely think if I were to kind of put them in categories, I think the number one use are children, um, specifically on the swing set. So definitely would love to see the swing set kept around. I didn't know it was unique to our park. That's great. Definitely like to keep that there. Um, I had bought the swing set area and I that's where I park my car. My driveway is right there. So I see folks on that swing set all the time. Um, I feel like pickleball has been like the resurgence of the park. Uh, I think that's probably the number two most used area. Um, thanks to Paul and everyone who's contributed to that. Um, I do kind of feel like tennis has taken a backseat um, to those categories there, the children and pickleball. Um, Maybe I'm just not going at the times that you all go, but I have seen less and less folks use the tennis courts. And being that it's just such a large area, um, I'm curious to know like if it is the best use of our space. But for folks who you know play tennis regularly, I definitely don't want to take that away from y'all. Just more so posing a question. Um, what I use the park primarily for is walking my dog. Um, there's a ton of dog owners in the area. Um, I think one challenge we have is there's not a lot of green space. Um, so definitely would like to see that. Um, there's definitely a ton of curbs as well. Um, I think that's, you know, something that folks have mentioned for accessibility and for drainage. Um, but I almost wonder if more grass would just be helpful for a number of reasons and, <clears throat> even like a separate area for folks to, you know, have their dog, like a little corner area. Um, Cause I know that some folks, you know, want to use the grass and I just worry like that grass that we currently have is kind of gross. Lots of holes dig in there, dug in there um, probably by dogs. So I'm curious if like any separation might be helpful. Um, I do, I'm aware there's only a couple entrances. I kind of think that's a good thing though. I think the only natural other entrance would be on Mill Street and that is just such a busy street. You really don't want uh, an entrance there in my opinion. Um, so I wanted to mention that. Um, I'm not sure if it's a normal thing that folks want um, is no lighting. Uh, it definitely gets dark, especially this time of year, very early. And with all the trees, um, it feels like it's dark even before the sun sets. 
So there's something I want to mention again. I'm not sure if that's by design. Um, maybe some turf um, would be helpful when we're looking at, you know, multi-purpose areas and green space. Um, and I think that's everything on my list. I think I'm going to ask Nellie um, for you to respond regarding lighting and what the city's take on lighting is. Sure, yeah. Um, lighting is something that we can certainly explore. Um, pedestrian lighting or sport court lighting. Um, it, if the community, if all of you feel strongly about it, the one thing I'll say about lighting is that it's expensive and, and um, it has the tendency to take up a lot of the construction budget. And so it would, you know, it's a trade-off that we would have to, to think about if, um, if we wanted to move forward with some kind of lighting on the site. And folks in the chat are, um, are responding, uh, with mixed feelings, but some people feeling that it should be left dark um, and others thinking that if there were lights added that shut off would be helpful. Um, so I think that this is something we'd like to maybe hear a little bit more about. Um, it seems like you all, for the most part, would want the lighting to be relatively minimal because of how close your houses are and, and other things. Um, so we can talk more about this, I think. It would be great to hear more feedback. There's parts of our survey that allow you to just add extra things. So if that's the extra thing you want to add, go for it. Tell us what you how you feel about lighting. I would echo Nellie's concerns about how much it costs to light um, a park and light it well. Because if you light some areas and not others, you want to make sure that if you lit an area, say like the tennis court at night, um, You'd want to have lighting all the way to it because you wouldn't want to have a hot spot in one spot and then have a really dark area next to it because it then makes it unsafe. So you'd want to have consistent lighting so that you can get to and from areas. So that is kind of one of the best practices that we use, that if you're going to light any area, you need to sort of consistently light all areas so that it's safe, if that makes sense. I, my, want to ask a question. I, I know we have a couple other people um, who have their hand raised. Um, in looking back through the history of the park renovations over the, the last couple of decades, like we said before, we looked at it to see that there were things that were changed and moved. And there was basketball. And we have a participant named Mary who has been chiming in a little bit about some of the history. Um, we we are aware that the tennis court used to be a basketball court and then it was changed into tennis. And sometimes these things happen just because that's what the, the, the demographics of the neighborhood might change and say one, like basketball players may have moved out or maybe people thought it was a nuisance and decided tennis court was more palatable. We don't know. So if you, if anybody in the neighborhood knows why basketball was removed um, and whether or not it, it was removed because it was problematic in any kind of way, um, or if it was just that there were a lot of people who really were asking for tennis courts. We don't know that background. So we'd love to hear from you all. Um, and maybe we could take the other two questions too, just because those folks have had hands up. Okay, so I'm going to unmute Jeffrey. There you go. Take it away, Jeffrey. We can't hear you if you're talking. No, we don't hear you. Could you try um, typing in the chat, perhaps, or? How about that? Oh, we hear. I can hear you. I had a double mute going on. Oh. <laughs> hey, listen, I. Um... I know we just uh, kind of just landed on that basketball thing. There used to be like two full courts and a half court, right? Um, I think a lot of uh, demographically, a lot of the kids grew up, uh, moved out, parents stayed. 
So uh, the neighborhood didn't have the the neighborhoods didn't have kids to support the basketball courts, but a lot of people were still coming in and using it. But they didn't use it the way someone who lived here would maybe, right? If you're just coming in, you're making a mess, you're making noise, you don't care, you don't know the kid, a guy, a person across the street. So anyway, that's kind of, I think, why um, it ended up being a pivot away from basketball uh, demographically and then just, you know, kids coming in, uh, teenagers, young, young, whoever, you know, parking wise and uh, just a respect for the space uh, or lack of respect of the space, I think was an issue. Um, I had a couple other things I want to know. And I have a daughter. She's seven. This is Madeline. Hi. Hi. She's Madeline. very concerned about monkey bars, if there will still be monkey bars there. Um, so I wanted to note that. And I do, I know someone mentioned that the, the swings take up a lot of room, but you know, Madeline's probably is seven. She's probably one of the older older kids now, right? And there's probably about twenty, twenty five kids between the ages of two and six. So, you know, while uh it may take up some space, I think we get used quite a bit. And even if we could add, you know, instead of two and two, if it was three and three or two and four, you know, two kids two my well, baby swings and four adult swings or whatever they're called, I do think they get quite a bit of use, you know, depending on you know, you get the kids all getting over there, and then it's like, okay, only two kids can go on the swing, uh, and there's plenty of other um, kids kind of waiting or, or figuring out what to do. Um, and back to, you know, we there used to be an entrance or opening on Mill Street, right? Uh, that was taken away, I don't know, Paul, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And I would just agree. It's just it, it, that's a hazard where if you, you really have to be concerned about your kids running around there because you can't let them near that enter entrance or exit, right? Because you never know what's coming down in those streets. It, it does tend to get a little speedy, as people have mentioned. Um, my two cents on the on the lights would be just, no, we don't need them. Uh, we get street lights, you gotta go home and the street lights come on, right? But uh, in the summer, it, it, it stays dark enough, late enough, where you know you can still play until eight. Light enough, yeah. light enough. Light enough. It enough. Can, oh, it stays light enough, long enough, where you can still play until eight, eight thirty in the summer, you know, and then in the winter, it's too cold anyway. So that's just my two cents. Uh, two other quick things here: the splash pad we really like. You like that water fun function, um, it, and it doesn't really need to be enclosed just because it's, it's centralized, right? So it's in the middle of the park. Um, I don't know. That's my opinion on that one. Uh, agreed on more green and also agreed. We don't, I don't know why it was decided to have the, the green that's in there, you know, uh, encased in that cement curb. Uh, but I don't see any need for the cement curb. I think mean, people would be fine with that, getting rid of that. Um, and then also I heard, you know, bikes, you know, bike, a bike path would be great as long as that can kind of stay. You know, it doesn't have to be the length of the whole park or a circle of the whole park, but, you know, some kind of bike area where the kids can ride their bikes around. Oh, and pickleball. I think pickleball, I think it's been pr pretty heavily talked about here, but the um, addition, the newest addition of this pickleball has been a, a pretty good, um, very popular, uh, I would say. Awesome. That was great. Thank you both so much for your input. Especially on cars. <laughs> Who do we have next, Shauna? Okay, next is Kevin. Who's on mute now? Hello, Kevin. Oh, we have to unmute you, actually. I just, I just, there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, no, I wasn't going to get on until I did the survey and I saw the lights and I put them in the chat. But uh, one thing about when years ago, when we first moved in here, we did have teenagers in the park at night. So we we're always, uh, as a neighborhood, historically been against putting lights in there, probably for that reason. Um, but I agree with everybody, you know, everybody's using the park. Uh, I don't know how many people. Oh, we lost him. We did. Well, maybe he'll come back. Oh, he's there. 
Oh, there he is. Oh, we can't hear you, Kevin. One moment. I don't know what happened there. Oh, we can hear you now. There you go. Okay. No, just saying when they redid the park, a lot of these issues, you know, they came out to the neighborhood. That's when they put the loop, the walk around loop there. And I know a lot of dog walkers uh, use it. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's something there for everybody from the comments tonight. But um, it is a residential area. I know the basketball, when we had it, it was very loud. Teenagers, there were some incidents, you know, they were competing on the, the use of the basketball. So when they redid the park, they put the tennis courts where the basketball courts were. And it seemed to work out. Um, so, but one of the things was it's very loud. And I'm on Elm Street with the pickleball now. And uh, if anything can be done with the fencing, maybe put up some some uh, sound, you know, keep the sounds down a little bit. That would be helpful. Um, but my my grandkids come. We use the park. Uh, we, as Paul said, we had a community. We use it for, for community events. So it's been very well. But I just uh, thought I'd just add my two cents, especially with the, the lights. I think that's... Uh, not a good idea for this pack. It's not ne necessary. Hey, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and I will respond to two um, things that I've heard about the, the sound of the pickleball courts. That's something that we've heard a lot of um, feedback about in different neighborhoods because everybody wants a pickleball court, but no one wants to hear a pickleball court. And we are working on ways to figure out how to buffer sound, but so far there hasn't really been a strategy like with fencing or, um, you know, padding that has like really been super effective. So that is something to consider, um, at least that the Boston Parks can like support and operate. Um, so that would be something that we would ask the community to sort of like embrace, if you will, to some degree. And we it doesn't mean we won't continue to look for other solutions to help with that. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to respond about was like the speeding and the request for speed bumps and sidewalk adjustments. And it's true, most of you um, are correct, that it's not um, part of this scope. We don't really have any kind of control over the streets department work, but that doesn't mean that I can't also um, bring that request forward to um, another department. So I will um, certainly follow up with the correct point person about that issue. And I can't make any promises, but thank you for bringing it to um, my attention. And we will certainly consider that in the design of the park. And I also just want to add that Everyone who's participating in this um, chat or who came, or sorry, not the chat in the meeting and had to register, your um, email addresses are getting logged into a contact um, file that we will use to send you any kind of updates about the next meeting. Um, so fret not that you will you will certainly be included on any any um, survey. Um, any future surveys or any community meeting updates um, or construction updates as well. Um, do we have more hands raised? No, nope. that was it. All right. Um, Nelly, there were some um, comments in the chat. I'm not sure you guys want to address. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering how far back to go. There's lots of comments. Um, we certainly will read through all of these. I'm looking for questions. I see a lot of really great um, feedback. I don't see a lot of questions. I didn't see a lot of questions either. There, there it, it was deaf. I was, I was trying to watch these as we were going along, keep yeah. an eye on this. Um, I, it, if this is something that does get recorded or printed out, that will be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say again that anybody who wrote things in the chat, if you could please go online to take the opinion survey so that the things that you 
spent time typing on this that you could also type in there because what that online survey helps us to do is actually generates it, you know, it does technological things that we can do if we sat here with a, like a ticker and like and like check things off. But every time someone uses a word within the descriptions of things, we can we can see trends that you all have in common, which is really what we want to understand is like where are the, the common grounds with you and your neighbors and the and the trends so that we know that we're heading in the right direction so that there is this is really a community supported effort. So I know that some folks probably don't like the technology of, of doing this kind of thing, um, but it's so helpful. So um, if you are a neighbor and you know somebody who maybe is not as technologically savvy as, as you are, um, and you wanna reach out to them and see if you could help them fill it out or anything like that, that would be really helpful. Um, and again, please share this while widely with your neighborhood groups. And I do see one question from Brian, which is, can we steal the budget from other neighborhoods and add it to our park, which is a funny question, but the answer <laughs> is no, <laughs> we can't do that. But I will say that um, the project budget for, for Burn Playground is $1.85 million. And um, that's that's a that's a, a solid um, construction budget. Um, it's uh, I feel excited about it, and you know that that also includes design and um, all the construction materials and construction administration and everything. But um, we are this is a, a solidly funded project. We are not skimping on burn playground. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that, um, and I don't see any other questions at this very moment. Um, okay. I, again, thank you so much for people who are writing in the chat and for filling out the survey. I, I do want to say a couple of things. Maybe, Mark, maybe just as we're ending here, I want to go back if we can. Can you go back to the circulation diagram? There was a lot of talk about the, about the access points and things like that. We definitely want to understand that more. So, um, we understand that the that mill is busy. Also, it's a grade change. Um, so it would be kind of difficult to actually make connections there. I think that one of the things that we wanted to, I just wanted to clarify that one of the things that we are concerned about with the courts and with the playgrounds is that there's a single entrance there. Less concern about there being only two or two and a half entrances if the vehicular access is something. Um, I guess it's just a sometime only when it's left open, but best practices for any kind of place that's enclosed is to have more than one gate. Um, and we have that to the park and maybe it's beneficial to add more, but places like the playground or the tennis court or the pickleball court, I mean, this is sort of doom and gloom kind of um, attitude, but the reality is that if you are in those spaces and someone were to shut off the one access point, you couldn't get out. And so it may just be as simple as that we have more than one gate that leads to the playground area, or we have more than one gate that leads that leads to the tennis court, such that if someone's blocking the way. And this is also true if, say, uh, as a child, I was very afraid of dogs and wouldn't go in and out of an exit if there was a dog near there. Um, having a second means of egress out of his place is, is just sort of best practices. Um, that's what we were taught, what I was talking about when I kept pointing out that each of these areas only had one door. Less concern really about the access off the streets, although there's been a lot of talk about it. So we wanna read those comments and we wanna understand a little bit more. Um, so just a bit of clarification. Thank you for everybody for now chiming in again. So you all are great. Can't wait to meet you someday in person. Awesome. So again, thank you so much, um, all of you for joining. And thank you so much to Naomi and Mark and Anna for your amazing work. Um, we're so happy that we have such a engaged community and that there's so much activity going on. It's it's really exciting and awesome. 
Um, please feel free to email individually if you uh, have any questions that pop up. And um, please don't forget to fill out the survey before December 20th and keep um, uh, checking out the Boston Parks website for this um, park project for any additional updates. And we will also email you them too if you would like. So thank you so much. And again, the meeting will has been recorded and will be posted to the Boston Parks website within a week. So you will be able to share it with other people who missed the meeting. <laughs>